The United Nations says that Afghanistan has the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. A Taliban edict banning women from working is hindering the delivery of international aid. As the UN discusses the future of its mission, what's next for Afghans? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Decades of war since the 1970s have left Afghanistan is a, in a dire humanitarian crisis. Around 97% of its people live in poverty, while 28 million need aid just to survive this year. Since it returned to power in August 2021, the Taliban has introduced a series of curbs on women's freedoms, including a ban on women working. The United Nations says that that's unacceptable because it threatens the work of aid agencies. Senior UN officials have been meeting this week in Doha and Kabul without the Taliban to decide on the future of the mission. We'll be discussing the implications of all of this for the Afghan people with our guests. But first, let's talk to the head of the Taliban political office in Doha, Suhail Shaheen, who's uh, here in uh, Doha. Good to have you with us, sir. The Taliban, as we said, wasn't invited to those talks in Doha. What's your view on that? Uh, yes, uh, uh, that uh, uh, to have meeting about Afghanistan to know uh, the issues in Afghanistan, uh, the humanitarian uh, uh, crisis, the need uh, for a humanitarian need, and also development project. Uh, this a uh, good thing, but uh, uh, you see there was no. A delegation in participation from the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, I think it was a flaw, because uh, if they do not listen to us, do not uh, listen to our uh, angle of view to identify the issue, what the, the issues the people of Afghanistan are facing, how they can resolve. Uh, issues. Uh, so it was uh, one-sidedly, uh, no uh, issue can be resolved one-sidedly. Okay. So, 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 but but, but yeah. what, about, what about the Taliban listening to what the UN and the international community are saying? As we said in the introduction, uh, the, the curb on women's freedoms, the, the ban on them working uh, is unacceptable, according to the UN. And that's why international donors are not keen uh, to, to, to fund the UN's humanitarian effort? Uh, we have uh, never said that we deny uh, women access uh, to education, but we say it should be in the light of our values and rules. So, uh, you know, uh, the people of Afghanistan, they struggle for uh, their liberation for 20 years. So they want to resolve all, sh all issues uh, whether education and other issues uh, according to our values and laws. And that, for that, it is necessary that the two sides, the UN and other, uh, who want uh, to, to, to resolve issue, to sit uh, with us, with uh, our leadership, with our dele delegation, and first identify the issue and then go how to resolve them. But without our participation and our delegation, they are deciding one-sidedly and even do not identify the ground realities which are prevalent in Afghanistan. I think uh, that is uh, a flaw. Is there any appetite for compromise, at least on, on, on your side of uh, this, this disagreement? We want to resolve all issues. With all problems according to uh, to our uh, laws and uh, uh, our uh, values. Uh, we do not say we do not resolve. We, we want to resolve them. But uh, something, uh, what they want, maybe the, the difference of culture, the values, it is a reality. We want to, to resolve all issues, including education, uh, in the light of our values. We you, didn't, we, yeah. we, we haven't said, uh, never said that we do not want uh, to resolve that or, or we you, deny. You, you talk, sir, about your, your values and customs. Uh, be before 
the Taliban came back to power two years ago. It made certain assurances, which it has, has U-turned upon. Is there any debate within the Taliban itself uh, that it needs to change its stance on, on certain issues in order to prevent the people of Afghanistan starving? So, I heard this uh, issue should not be politicized. The people are uh, suffering because of the sanctions. And humanitarian relief, humanitarian aid should be separate uh, from, uh, uh, from other issues. And they should not be used as a tactic of pressure against the people. You see, the sanctions, uh, um, you know, have uh, made the people of Afghanistan to suffer. And uh, I want to uh, uh, say one, another point that, at the beginning, the secondary school were open, the universities were open. Even at that time, uh, the, the, the sanctions were imposed on Afghanistan. At that time, even the, 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 the women were working for the NGOs, for the United Nations. Why at that time the sanction was uh, imposed and still uh, continuing? All right, so, uh, but that's not the situation now. Women are, are, are unable to work in the country. The UN says that that threatens the work of, of aid agencies uh, across the country. The fact that the teenage girls can't go to school uh, and that uh, in uh, certain circumstances, aid is delivered uh, and distributed through school children who, who take that, that home back to hungry families. Uh, what is the Taliban doing to feed its people? Uh, first, I say, two years ago, those the, with the, they are mentioning there was nothing, no hurdle at that. And even uh, now, uh, the, 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 if there, it's important, uh, the women who need, are in need of uh, uh, relief, uh, the, the United Nations can deliver them. Even men can deliver uh, them. Even uh, the, we have uh, uh, elders in villages, they can deliver to any widows. Uh, we have uh, about 40,000 widows registered in the Ministry of uh, Martyrs and disabled, they are uh, delivering uh, uh, AIDS and uh, payment every month uh, to them. So that is not uh, a, a, a hurdle. Uh, still, about uh, their working in NGOs and uh, United Nations in education, so uh, we are working uh, all issues, including these, to be resolved uh, according to our uh, laws. Because uh, the, the people of Afghanistan want that, because the, the people, they struggle for uh, that, and they want uh, that uh, the problem should be resolved, but according to our values. For that, we need to sit with any side, including the United Nations. They uh, know our position. We will know their position and proceed how to resolve the issues. All right, good to talk to you so many. Thanks indeed for being with us on Inside Stories. So hail Shaheen there, who is the Taliban's international spokesman. Well, let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From Kabul, we're joined by a familiar face, James Bayes, Al Jazeera's uh, diplomatic editor who was following those UN meetings in Doha and Kabul this week and who's reported extensively on Afghanistan for many years. From Toronto, Mina Sharif, an Afghan rights activist who founded Sisters for Sisters, a mentorship program for women and girls in marginalized communities. Mina also developed Voice of Afghan Youth, a TV and radio series. And from New York, Obaidola Bahir, a lecturer in transitional justice at the American University of Afghanistan and the founder of the Save Afghans from Hunger campaign. Welcome to you all. James, uh, let's start with you. You heard what the Taliban spokesperson uh, said there. What happened at the Doha conference this week? Does anyone have any leverage over the Taliban? Well, it's a real problem. I mean, I think first let's explain what the Doha conference was, and it was criticised by lots of people because uh, the main issue that they were trying to deal with was the Taliban and its relationship to the women of Afghanistan, and there were no Afghan women invited and there were no Taliban invited. That, though, was not the purpose, according to the UN Secretary-General, who I spoke to about it. He said, what I wanted to do with my conference this time was get the international community all on the same page, because if you have unity of the the international community, then perhaps you have some lever leverage uh, with uh, the Taliban. But they don't hold many cards. They did get a UN Security Council resolution through last week condemning the Taliban and their policies uh, towards women. And it had been hard to get unity on the UN Security Council. At this meeting, what came out of it? Well, 
not a great deal in the sense that the main achievement seems to be uh, an agreement to call yet another meeting of the same people, of members of the international community, of neighbouring countries, of uh, regional powers, of the big international powers, the, the uh, uh, five permanent members of the Security Council. And the hope is, I was told by one senior UN source, when you have other meetings taking place, you've got one about to start uh, with the Pakistan Foreign Minister and the Chinese Foreign Minister meeting the Taliban foreign minister. Um, the hope from senior UN sources is that when the Chinese and Pakistanis meet with the Taliban, for example, they now know the script from the international community, the parameters from the international community. And, and, and in terms of influence, are China and Pakistan the, the, the people who are best placed to, 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 to exert influence over the Taliban? Well, there aren't many people who do have a lot of influence on the Taliban. I think Pakistan, when the Taliban first took power, thought it would have more influence than it does. And in fact, in many ways, the situation has backfired for Pakistan with regard to the Pakistan uh, Taliban and uh, the fact that they seem to effectively have a safe haven uh, now uh, in Afghanistan to do some of their operations and organizations. Uh, but yes, Pakistan still is a country with more influence influence than quite a few others, and China uh, certainly is interested in playing a role here, which is interesting because it's part, I think, of China to playing a more assertive role on the diplomatic stage worldwide. You saw what happened uh, with Saudi Arabia and Iran, that rapprochement brokered uh, by China, and in fact, only the other week, the Chinese ambassador to the UN saying they wanted to get involved in, in, in negotiations between Israel and Palestine. So yes, Chinese China, an important international power. Uh, Mina Sharif, what's your view of uh, the UN's position, its handling of, of the crisis in Afghanistan? Is it, is it worsening the plight of the Afghan people? I mean, how can it hold talks on Afghanistan without including Afghans in those talks? Right. So um, I, I'm actually confused about uh, where the UN is coming from. Are they comfortably... Um, compromising their own values and standards that are outlined in their mandate and in this soft approach that they have taken with the Taliban to date? Um, or are they confused about the situation in Afghanistan to begin with? Um, either way, part of that beginning towards a solution in that is including Afghan voices in the conversations. I mean, it's, it's quite absurd that meetings are held about a country without members of that country present. And I think if you were to replace uh, the name Afghanistan with any other country, this would be laughable. But uh, for whatever reason, this cycle is allowed to continue. Um, the UN and international community is not holding um, their position on Afghanistan to the same standard they would hold anywhere else. Um, and of course, that is frustrating the Afghan community. Um, also, even just this fixation on school is, is dangerous because they're doing so much more than that. And it's washed over and it's uh, it's dismissed because we're able to um, almost give them leeway by keeping the subject so limited when if Afghans were brought to the table, so much more would be brought to light. All go against the mandates of, uh, of acceptability, both by the UN and the international community. Uh, uh, Obedala, um, at, at the nub of this, of course, is, is, is the world's desire to help the people of Afghanistan without further empowering the Taliban. Can that be done? It's a tricky situation, obviously. It's not something the international community is very used to. Um, I mean, the meeting's purpose initially, we also have to understand that um, engagement helps. You engage with your enemies uh, because you want to figure out how to move forward. It doesn't necessarily mean you're endorsing them. So those are very different things. Uh, we have to understand that the Afghan economy is in a very fragile state and that the Afghan people do not have the option of opting out of the regime that is ruling the country today. Um, however, I think that um, expecting uh, the UN to include all parties uh, in a conversation which is specifically meant for the special envoys for them to have a cohesive approach towards Afghanistan. Unity of expectation is a very important part of any dialogue with an opposite side. Uh, the fact that the Taliban should be sitting within their group and talking to each other. International Afghans have to sit amongst themselves and have some unity of approach. Um, 
That's important. So I guess it's tone deaf of the Taliban as well to expect to be included in a meeting that is being held because of them, not for them. Um, but uh, I guess it has been um, a major failure on the UN's part to clarify the misinformation campaign around how their aid is making it to the hands of the Taliban. Um, that should have been clarified much earlier. Uh, that has an impact on the amount of pledges that come to Afghanistan, also on how aid is seen and as to whether aid can be dispersed to Afghans without empowering the Taliban and enabling their bad behavior. James, does, does the UN accept the criticism that's been leveled at it uh, uh, this week for not inviting uh, the Taliban to these talks? I mean, it, it is stuck between a rock and a hard place, isn't it? It has to balance its humanitarian obligations with the political uh, objectives of many of its donor nations. Yeah, I mean, I'm not here to defend the UN, of course. My, my, my job, I spend quite a lot of my time asking tough questions to the UN. But what the UN would say is that they do engage with the Taliban. They have a whole mission here in Kabul. Uh, they have a special representative, uh, Rosa Otunbayeva, who is a former president of Kyrgyzstan. She speaks to the Taliban. The deputy secretary general was here earlier in the year um, speaking to the Taliban. And I think the UN feeling on that is they went a long way sending the number two in the organization, uh, Amina Mohammed, who is also uh, a female Muslim, uh, to Afghanistan. And they got absolutely nothing from the Taliban in return. In fact, the Taliban just hardened uh, their position. So I, I think the, the UN will say they have been engaging with the Taliban. But as you say, it's very hard for the UN because they, you know, there, there are t two roads they could take, and neither of them are, put, are ones that they really want to take. And there's division um, in, within the UN circles. There's division between the political side of the UN and the humanitarian side. Now, the humanitarians are saying, yes, it's awful that the women can't work, but we must not stop the delivery of humanitarian aid. The figures are quite stunning. 97% of Afghans living uh, in poverty, and the UN really struggling with the money. It's only got 6% of the funding that it needs this year. So a really serious uh, situation. The Secretary General says it's the worst humanitarian situation anywhere on earth. The political side of, of the UN, um, they are saying something slightly different to the humanitarian side. They're saying if we give in on this issue of female UN workers, then we're never going to get women back in a normal place in society in Afghanistan. It's a very, very difficult decision. The UN's been struggling with it, lots and lots of meetings. In the end, I'm afraid, I think we're going to get a typical UN fudge. Uh, Mina, uh, James mentioned that the UN uh, uh, Deputy Secretary General. What do you make of the, the widely criticised talk of, uh, of baby steps being made towards recognition of, of the Taliban? Is it only a matter of time, do you think, before that happens? Well, I think this is really reminiscent of 2014 when Barack Obama announced that um, the international forces would be leaving um, Afghanistan. And it creates that sense of, uh, of panic, of loss of leverage that the women, for example, who are protesting on the streets have. Um, and rightfully so. All, all signs lead to it. Should uh, Afghan voices have been included in, in these meetings, we might feel differently. But because the cycle is repeating to uh, completely disable civil society, women's voices, anyone who is actually affected by what the Taliban's uh, decrees and ruling um, imp uh, uh, does to everyday life, none of those voices are, can, are included. And so the cycle looks like it's continuing. And so we have every right to believe that it's a repeat. Mina, to what extent has the UN made, made the people of Afghanistan dependent upon aid? I'm, I'm talking about historically now. Has it, you know, uh, well-meaning intention created the problem that it's now trying to, to circumvent today? Well, when we talk about aid, I think as a collective, we're under this impression that it is, uh, it's an act of generosity. I mean, the United Nations, for example, is a business. They have big salaries, they have political pull, and I don't know how we can call it a neutral organization or even let ourselves think it's neutral with those two, with those two points in mind. Um, it, it, when distributions happen from 
an, a business like the United Nations? Are they, for example, purchasing locally to um, to work towards a more sustainable economy within the country? No, they're not. They fly in their own staff. They fly in their own goods. And so, uh, as far as it being a solution driven um, program, I, I have not seen it to be um, so. It, ultimately, if we look at logic, aid dependency is is in their it's in their interest as a, as an existing um, organization. So no, I don't think they've been um, a solution in the past. But I do think, unfortunately, we we are in a position worse than we were um, before the international presence in Afghanistan when it comes to poverty um, and the risk that that has on everyday lives and people. So we do need the support. I just don't know why we have to accept the support with uh, blind gratitude rather than asking for accountability on how the Taliban are interacted with and on how that distribution takes place. Uh, Obadullah, um, will the Taliban ever compromise on its stance uh, on women and civil liberties? You heard what the, what the Taliban spokesperson was saying about it, its, its laws, its, its values, it, it, its culture. Um, if the UN or the international community uh, persist with this carrot and stick approach almost, who will win? Um, first off, for the sake of factual accuracy, the UN in Afghanistan, especially the World Food Programme, they procure locally through local vendors. Uh, so that helps the economy um, have some sort of circulation. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, it's quite ironic, honestly, to hear about values and norms that supposedly haven't been figured out um, in the past two years. Uh, we constantly hear a mention of laws. What laws? We don't have a constitution in place in Afghanistan. We see little inclination towards even drafting a constitution. There is complete centralization of power. And the problem is everyone looks at the Taliban like they are a Pandora box that we, or a black box that we don't understand, even though they have a political manifesto. Their chief of uh, justice has written a political manifesto endorsed by the emir himself, in which they say that women will stay at home, in which they say that women do not require worldly education. Um, all of these are fundamental beliefs within the movement. So whatever Whatever Suhail Shaheen or others are saying, even though their own daughters go to school, is, uh, for lack of any better word, hypocritical of them, uh, because they understand the value of education for women. Somehow, neither do they stand up to their leadership in changing the mindset that is dominant amongst the ruling class. Second, they keep defending it and making it sound like it's a temporary issue, whereas it is not. Six years of the first Taliban regime should have taught us a lesson. And right now, yes, leverages aren't working. There are ways to work around it if we modernize, evolve our approach with regards to the carrots and sticks that we have. Um, there are ways forward, uh, but I don't think hoping um, or believing the Taliban pledges helps us anymore. Uh, Mina, I, I saw you shaking your, your head there and disagreeing at one point. What, what was that you were disagreeing with? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I've never seen evidence that the UN has had a focus on uh, empowering local communities. And so I'd like to see that. It's just it's just interesting to me that we would be in favor of that, that sort of dependency. And it's obviously been created or we wouldn't be where we are today versus 20 years ago. Uh, James, you've been to Afghanistan many, many times over a number of years uh, with your work with, with Al Jazeera. Um, you haven't, though, been back there in, in, in two years since the Taliban came to power. I know you've, you've only been back in the country a matter of hours, but what are your first impressions upon landing there? Very important caveat that I rich, literally have only just landed here in the last few hours. Uh, and it's Friday, so it's the weekend, so much quieter than normal. Um, it is very odd feeling for someone who's lived here in the past, who's been here numerous times since 2001, to see the streets and see so many things that are the same, but one fundamental thing that is completely different. Um, some things were, were very, very normal, to be honest with you. Um, you get your visa, it's exactly the same visa you used to get 
uh, from the previous government looks exactly the same. You arrive in the airport, uh, very efficient, working very, very uh, well, the airport, for me at least, when I arrived here. And interestingly, a contradiction perhaps, uh, I saw female staff in the airport. The, the, my bags were scanned as I came through uh, the, the scanner machine. That was operated by a woman working alongside men. Well, if that can operate uh, in the airport, why is that different from having uh, female students going to schools and universities? A, a sort of a great contradiction straight away uh, as I arrived in the country. I then made my way uh, where I am now to the Al Jazeera office, which I've been to many times before uh, in, in near the centre of Kabul, and looking where the used to see the big flag of uh, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, and really rather shocking to see the white flag of the Taliban flying, a giant white flag over Kabul. And, and James, what is the UN doing on the ground there in the country right now? Well, it's, I think, um, uh, not the easiest question because what they've said they're doing is stopping their work and keeping their, um, their teams at home um, uh, and working from home, trying to keep some sort of aid delivery, so trying to keep some sort of normal service, but not sending people out until they can resolve this issue on women. As I told you earlier on, there is the dispute between the political and the humanitarian side. The UN finally, I think, is going uh, to come out uh, with a, a position in the coming hours. Uh, but I think it's going to be difficult for them uh, going forward. Uh, they. they do not have unity within their team. And uh, I, I think that's going to make their work on the ground very, very hard indeed, uh, matched by all the other problems we've talked about, by the, the really bad state of the economy. Uh, and uh, th th that is just going to add to the, to, to, to the distress and hardship for, for so many Afghans. Uh, Mina, no, uh, the, the facts on the ground uh, are, are going to be very difficult to change, um, uh, I mean, politically, uh, in, in the short term, at least. In the meantime, people are dying of hunger and malnutrition, as James said, the, the, the suffering. I mean, how, 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 does, how do we move forward from this? How do we save lives? Well, I mean, the thing is, it gets blurred together, right? The, the politics and the and the situation are, are two very different things. I think the, there's a lot of hypocrisy going on in how we look at Afghanistan politically so differently than we would anywhere else. But at the end of the day, um, the situation was, um, was not helped in this past 20 years. It was worsened, uh, and the numbers will show that. So I think, uh, ultimately, we have to focus on aid as something as separate as we can from um, from the political situation, but that doesn't mean it has to come without accountability. I, I think when we're critical of the UN and, and the international community and their support of Afghanistan, it doesn't mean that we don't think that that aid is an emergency. It absolutely is. But it's because we feel it's, that it's such an emergency that we're demanding the accountability that, that okay. should go along with it. All right. There we're going to have to leave it. Many thanks indeed to, to all of you, James Bay, Smina Sharif and uh, Obedullah Hamia. Uh, as always... Thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the program again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha, thanks for being with us. We'll see you again. Bye for now.